Okay, brain tumours. I've been asked to talk about the surgical aspects because that's the only thing I know anything about. Um, and I know a lot of you here probably know more about that than I do, uh, having been on the receiving end of me. Um, so uh, I've just sort of kept it fairly, uh, not, not necessarily simple, but just fairly towards the surgical side. So um, I was asked to talk about how we do it and is, is there a role for second operations mainly. So just quickly going through. Um, so uh, I know you've had talks from um, Mike and James earlier on, so probably telling you all about the different types of tumours that we see. Basically, the groups of things that people get in their head, um, gliomas, which I guess is ma the majority of us here today. But don't forget there are other tumours called meningiomas, which grow from the lining around the brain. And they're generally regarded as benign tumours, but they're not always benign tumours. And they can behave in a way just as aggressively as the more aggressive gliomas. Um, the brain's a fairly common spot for cancers elsewhere to spread, so a lot of our work is actually taking out um, cancers that are spread to the brain from lung, breast, um, gut, and particularly melanoma in this country. Um, and then there are a number of other tumours that are somewhat rarer but um, also come, in, come into our sort of uh, work, uh, and there are different types of tumours often in children as well. So there are a number of different types of tumours or cancers that can occur within the brain uh, or within the, the head um, that we have to deal with. Um, yeah, on the glioma side, it can get incredibly complex trying to sort out uh, what you've got or how to label it, and that, this slide is deliberately confusing. Uh, because it is confusing, uh, and you've probably had some you know, more information earlier today. Should I should I stand like that? Thank you. Sorry. Um, okay. Can I take it off? Is that better? All right. Um, so yeah. So you've had talks today telling you all about that, and there are this enzyme and that enzyme and that gene and that this gene, and if you think it's hard to understand, you're not the only one. I have trouble understanding it as well. And the only consolation is that next year it'll probably all change. Um, so, yeah, but it's good to see that there's so much work being done on, these, on all these uh, genetic studies and so forth, and hopefully something good will come of that. But that's why we're here, and that's why we're funding research, is to, is to find that out. Because I think my dream is that one day no one like me will get up and talk to you because there won't be any place for surgery for these things. Um, so, however, currently there is still a role for surgery and uh, for better or worse, we're still fairly deeply involved with all types of brain tumours. Um, so what do we do? Um, part of our role is to get a tissue diagnosis. So in the vast majority of tumours, we would at least try and get a tissue diagnosis so we know what we're dealing with. And also these days for all the genetic studies that can be done on the tumours, in a, an attempt to see whether they'll respond to one or other type of treatment apart from the surgery and, and radiotherapy. Um, sometimes a tumour will be causing a big lump in the head and causing pressure, and so part of our role is to basically take the lump out and relieve that pressure so we can uh, improve things that way. Sometimes a tumour can be involving a part of the brain that does something. Um, there are various parts of the brain that don't do too much, but there are quite a bit where things do happen. And uh, sometimes by removing the tumour or taking the bulk of the tumour away, uh, we're, we're fortunate enough that people's function might improve. Um, the next one's got a question mark. Um, whether what we do makes a difference long term to the other treatments or not. And that's where it becomes a bit controversial. Uh, there is some evidence that says, yes, if you can take 97% of the tumour out, then those people will do better. How you ever measure that, I really don't know. Um, and the other difficulty is that there are some tumours that, you know, a good spot, yes, you can say we've got a good clearance of that. There are other tumours that are not in a good spot and we're never going to get that sort of clearance. So the amount of tumour that's taken out, particularly with gliomas, very much depends on the location of that tumour and the 
and the morphology of that tumour, if you like, um, uh, rather than you're going to this surgeon or that surgeon. Um, but there's, it, it is one of, one of those areas where you will see a lot of differing information. Um, yeah, we try, generally our approach here is we try and get out as much as we can. And there are some that you know, are suitable for that. Um, I apologise if anyone here sees themselves up here. Um, you know, you're all part of the education. So. Um, so there's something like that. Is it showing up okay, that one? It's big enough, yeah. So you can see a white bit at the back there on the left and um, you, know, you can see it seems reasonably well circumscribed and sure, that proved to be something that yeah, as, an, as a surgeon, I was able to think, oh, yeah, I've got, you know, pretty much all that out. And I um, uh, won't tell you who it is. <laughs> um, uh, whereas uh, that one, I'm not sure, again, how well that shows um, reasonably well, but you can just see that sort of fairly vague, lighter area there towards the top on the left and going towards the middle. And that sort of thing, you know, is not really suitable for someone to do aggressive surgery on because that person will just not come out the person they are if, if we get too aggressive with that. So we have to always temper our decision um, about how much to take out with the worry about whether we're going to make someone's function worse. And I think with very rare exceptions, I think it's very hard to justify deliberately taking something out knowing that it's going to leave someone with some sort of functional impairment just in an attempt to be getting a big bigger percentage of tumour out. But that's my view. Um, uh, so, yep. Uh, I was asked to talk about... Um, yeah. So I think I explain things well to people. I don't know, there might be a number of people around here today who can agree or disagree with that. Um, and I think I explain what I'm going to do, but I guess, you know, if when you're in a consultation with me or one of the surgeons prior to surgery and you've been told that you've got a brain tumour of some sort and you're going to need an operation, you're probably not going to take too much notice of all the detailed explanation that follows that, and I should accept that. So I give a detailed explanation of what I'm going to do, uh, and then first question I get generally asked after the operation is that. <laughs> um, so uh, I was asked to talk today a little bit about the mechanics of surgery. Um, so I hope that's okay. Uh, so this is what we do. Um, okay, we'll let the bad stuff out and let the sun shine in. So yeah, right. that's generally it. <laughs> okay. Um, so these days, it's, yeah, probably uh, from when I started doing this, which was 35 years ago, um, there's probably been a few changes. Um, most of them technological in terms of imaging and being able to, literally being able to find where you want to go. Um, so nowadays we have, uh, you'll hear about machines called stereotactic machines. And those of you who have been through it have gone into hospital and someone's done a scan and put all these little dots on your head, uh, which are to go with that machine. Um, so what you can see here, hopefully, is basically the screen of that machine. Don't have a pointer, do we? Um, and I think you can probably see a little white lump sitting up in the brain uh, on that scan and a little crosshatch thing there, which is basically the, the target point. Uh, so that's on a screen, on a, on a machine in the operating theatre. So the scan goes into that. Um, and uh, is that showing well? Reasonably, yeah. So there's the machine. Um, the thing at the top is actually a camera. Uh, and that camera... Um, uh, I'll show you in a minute then. This is this, oh sorry, I only put this slide in and it's a bit pale, but I was told, I was, these, these were taken yesterday and I said to the anaesthetist, so I have to give a talk on surgery for brain tumours tomorrow. 
And the anaesthetist said, huh, that'll be right. There'll be the surgeon all the time and people thank the surgeon and blah, 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 blah. And what about the anaesthetist? <laughs> okay. Well, there's a little person in the back there and that's the anaesthetist. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and all they do is keep you alive. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, you can see this little thing here has little four little balls on it. Uh, and that is fixed, that is fixed to the frame that fixes your head. So um, fortunately most of you don't really quite know how hard we have your head clamped when we're doing your operation. But basically your head's fixed so it won't move uh, and that little thing is fixed to the clamp. So basically that little uh, frame there is in, a f is in a fixed location relative to your head and the camera sees that. Uh, so it knows where that those little balls are, and then there's an instrument which I'll show you in a minute. After me, so that that basically localizes where where we're going to go, um, and so then uh, make have to make a cut in the skin uh, once you're asleep. Once that little person in the background of that last photograph has done her work, you're asleep. Uh, make a little cut in the skin. Um, I don't know how well that's going to show. Uh, that's bone. So under the skin is the bone. There's a, your scalp is about that thick and under that is the bone. So we have to make a little saw cut in the bone and lift up a piece of bone as, as large as we need. Sometimes it can be quite small. Sometimes it needs to be very big. Uh, this is a small one. That's not showing terribly well, but that underneath that bone is a layer called the dura. Uh, it's quite a thick layer in most people, a bit like a thick piece of paper, uh, and that surrounds the brain. Uh, so we have to open that. Um, and yeah, and so the shiny bit you can see in the middle is actually the, the surface of the brain um, under that. So we open that up. And uh, uh, oh, here we are. Here's our frame. So here's the. Uh, don't know if you can see. There's four little balls there. So they're on the end of a probe instrument. So what the surgeon's doing there is putting that on the surface of the brain, and that will guide him or her to where that. You can see the little our little camera thing, our little screen up the top, and we look at that and we see where the the little cross hatch is going. And it says, yes, you're right over the top now. This is where you make your, your opening. So that navigation, all those navigation systems have made a huge difference to our ability to being able to know where we're going and find the right spot. Um, and once we've done that, then that's a, a magnified view of the brain surface there. And you can't see anything on the surface. It looks entirely normal. And yet there's a tumour only you know, three or four millimetres underneath that. Um, so with the navigation, we go down onto that. And that doesn't show terribly well on here, does it? No. Uh, what I was trying to show you was that normal brain is fairly white, which is that stuff there. And then the tumour itself in this, in this case uh, was somewhat uh, pinker in consistency and we could tell what it was with the naked eye. So this was one from yesterday and likely to be a tumour that's sort of come from somewhere else. Um, so, that's, so having done that, take that out and then put everything back together again, basically. Um, uh, so that, that's sort of, is that, yeah, that's sort of the, the nuts and bolts, if you like, of what happens to you when someone like me gets hold of you. Um, in the operating room. Um, the other thing I was asked to talk about was particularly from a glioma perspective, it's also for meningiomas I guess and other tumours, is, is there a role for doing a second operation at any time? Um, and I know for those of you who were here last year we, we sort of addressed that a bit then as well. Um, and it's a very hard one to answer because I think it's very much an individual situation. It depends on the type of tumour you're dealing with. Uh, depends on whether the tumour progression or recurrence uh, is fairly localised to an area. Um, uh, depends on how that person is going. Um, there is a great lack of evidence 
behind everything we do uh, for it. But I guess in, for instance, if we're dealing with, say, gliomas, then if someone has had a reasonable response to their initial treatment and there's recurrence that seems to be reasonably localised to the, the original site, and if you think there's a reasonable chance that you can make that person's life better uh, by taking that out, or if your oncologist says, if you can reduce the bulk of this, maybe something I can do will be a bit more effective, um, then I guess they're the situations where we might consider doing another operation. But often you find that it's, uh, there are things that you can see on imaging that make that less likely to be helpful. And I've just, um, I guess this is one just quickly to show you the dilemmas or the difficulties we have with um, dealing with, uh, as you all know, uh, in managing gliomas is sometimes even the diagnosis can be difficult to start with. So here's someone who's just had a sort of minor disturbance of function. Yeah. Screen here's not great, is it? Um, and you can just see a tiny little something there that nobody was quite sure what it was. So usual approach in that situation is, okay, let's just wait and do another scan in a month or two. Uh, so do another scan in a month or two and then it's blindingly obvious that there's something going on here and yeah, a uh, very typical appearance of a high grade or grade four glioma. Uh, so has surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, the whole bit and then progress scan is done and uh, I get a phone call, you know, can I, you know, is there a role for doing another operation? So I'd look at the scan and sure, if it was just that, um, then you'd probably say, okay, that looks fairly localised. There may be some value in resecting that and taking it out again. But if we look at the scan a bit more closely, we can see something down here that looks a bit suspicious and if we went up a little bit higher on the same person you can see something a bit further up there and that indicates that there's tumour that's sort of spread to distant parts of the brain beyond the initial sort of site and in that situation yeah, I don't think really surgery has anything to offer so it's a very individual circumstance as to you know, whether you would reoperate or not. Um, and I think that's about the end of the formal slides I've got there. Um, uh, so, questions? Sorry? Um, let's see if anyone's calling me. No, I'm okay at the moment. Yeah, so, yeah, if you want to give yours and then have questions. Yep, okay.